and welcome to the second part of a two-part lecture on the introduction to the immune system. In part one, I discussed the first division of the mammalian immune system called innate immunity. Innate immunity involves five barriers to infection. Can you recall what they were and how they work? If not, you'll want to review part one again. Innate immunity is simply a barrier to infection. It's referred to as nonspecific because it doesn't matter what the invading pathogen is. In part two, I'll introduce adaptive immunity, sometimes called acquired immunity. This is the type of immunity that your immune system must learn. The immunity you develop from adaptive immunity is specific. It's the type of immunity that makes you immune to things like the flu, chicken pox, or other types of viral infections. The downside is that you normally get sick first, and then your immune system develops immunity so you can't get infected a second time by the same virus. Vertebrate animals, including humans, are unique in having acquired immunity in addition to innate immunity. The adaptive response relies on B and T cells, which are types of white blood cells collectively called lymphocytes. Some lymphocytes migrate to the thymus gland, an organ in the thoracic cavity just above the heart. These lymphocytes mature into T cells, other lymphocytes that remain in the bone marrow develop as B cells. Still, other lymphocytes will remain in the blood and become natural killer cells. Any substance that elicits a response from a B or T cell is called an antigen. An antigen is any foreign substance that, when introduced into the body, is capable of an immune response. In adaptive immunity, Recognition of antigens occurs when a B or T cell binds to an antigen by way of a protein called an antigen receptor. Antigen receptors are specific enough to bind to just one part of a molecule of a particular pathogen. All of the antigen receptors of B and T cells are identical. Infection of a virus, bacterium, or other pathogen triggers activation of B and T cells with antigen receptors specific for parts of that pathogen. Antigens are usually proteins or polysaccharides. This, this model shows how antigens might appear on the surface of a bacteria. B cells work chiefly by secreting soluble substances known as antibodies. They mill around a lymph node, waiting for a macrophage to bring an antigen or for an invader such as a bacteria to arrive. When an antigen-specific antibody on a B cell matches up with an antigen, a remarkable transformation occurs. The antigen binds to the antibody receptor. The B cell engulfs the antibody and the antigen and presents the antigen on its surface using a structure called a major histocompatibility complex, or an MHC. I'll describe M MHCs in a bit. The helper T cell joins the action and secretes a cytokine called a lymphokine, a signaling chemical or a ligand that will activate other lymphocytes to join in the fight. The B cell becomes a large plasma cell that produces identical copies of free-floating antigen receptors called antibodies at an astonishing pace, up to 10 million copies an hour. Antibodies belong to a family of large protein molecules known as immunoglobins. Scientists have identified nine chemically distinct classes of human Im immunoglobins, four kinds of IgG and two kinds of IgA, plus IgM and IgE and IgD. Immunoglobins G, D, and E are similar in appearance. IgG, the major immunoglobin in the blood, is also able to enter tissue spaces. It works efficiently to coat microorganisms, speeding their destruction by other cells in the immune system. Scientists long wondered how all the genetic information needed to make millions of different antibodies could fit in a limited number of genes. The answer is that antibody genes are spliced together from widely scattered bits of DNA located on two different chromosomes. 
Each antibody molecule is made up of two separate chains, a heavy chain and a light chain. The heavy chain is where the binding of antigens occurs. So much genetic variation is involved in its assembly. For example, to form a heavy chain, one of 400 possible variable gene segments combines with one of 15 diversity segments and one of four joining segments. This makes 24,000 possible combinations for the DNA encoding the heavy chain alone. Now, about the major histocompatibility complex, or MHCs, of your immune cells. An MHC protein serves as a recognizable scaffold that presents pieces, or peptides, of a foreign protein to the immune cells. Every cell in your body is covered with MHC self-marker proteins. MHC proteins perform antigen presentation, the display of an antigen fragment on the infected cell surface. This way, other white blood cells can do their work of recognizing and destroying the infected cell or the pathogen itself. T cells contribute to immune de defense in two major ways. Some help re regulate the complex workings of the overall immune response, while others are cytotoxic and directly contact infected cells and destroy them. Chief among the regulatory T cells are helper T cells. They're needed to activate many immune cells, including B cells. Cytotoxic T cells, sometimes called killer T cells, help rid your body of cells that have been infected by viruses as well as cells that have been transformed by cancer. At least two types of lymphocytes are killer cells, cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells. Both types contain granules filled with potent chemicals. Both types kill on contact. They bind to their targets, aim their weapons, and deliver bursts of lethal chemicals called target-oriented granules. Now to attack, cytotoxic T cells need to recognize a specific antigen bound to a self-major histocompatibility complex marker. Helper T cells can recognize presented antigens as well. Their job is to bring this antigen to a B cell and activate the B cell to create antigen receptors that are specific to the antigen. The B cell will clone itself and create antigen-specific antibodies that can go on to help destroy the pathogen, and the B cell will clone itself into long-lasting memory B cells that will give the animal long-term immunity from the pathogen in case that pathogen shows up again. To summarize, adaptive immunity can be divided into two forms. Cell-mediated immunity is an immune response that does not involve antibodies, but rather involves the activation of phagocytes, killer T cells, and the release of various cytokines in response to an antigen. In other words, it's the direct work of immune cells themselves. The humoral response is the aspect of, of immunity that is mediated by antibodies or complement proteins that affect the pathogen. Humoral immunity is so named because it involves substances found in the humors of the body or the body fluids. Well, that's enough to absorb for now. The music's telling me that this video has come to an end. I hope you've taken some good notes, and if you have any questions, write them, write them down and bring them to class. And we'll see you then. Hey, if you're not one of my students, you can still access and print out the note slides for each of my videos if you go to the web address printed above me, if you'd like to contact me, you can make comments to the videos through the YouTube page or subscribe to the web page above and leave comments. I'd love to help you out if I can.